Dickon the Devil by J. Sheridan Lefanu. About thirty years ago I was selected by two rich old maids to visit a property in that part of Lancashire which lies near the famous forest of Pendle, with which Mr. Ainsworth Lancashire Witches has made us so pleasantly familiar. My business was to make partition of a small property, including a house and demean to which they had of a long time before succeeded as co-heiresses. The last forty miles of my journey I was obliged to post, chiefly by crossroads, little known and less frequented, and presenting scenery often extremely interesting and pretty. The picturesqueness of the landscape was enhanced by the season, the beginning of September, at which I was travelling. I had never been in this part of the world before. I am told it is now a great deal less wild, and consequently less beautiful. At the inn, where I had stopped for a relay of horses and some dinner, for it was then past five o'clock, I found the host, a hale old fellow of five and sixty, as he told me, a man of easy and garrulous benevolence, willing to accommodate his guests with any amount of talk, which the slightest tap sufficed to set flowing on any subject you pleased. I was curious to learn something about Barwick, which was the name of the demean and house I was going to. As there was no inn within some miles of it, I had written to the steward to put me up there the best way he could for a night. The host of the Three Nuns, which was the sign under which he entertained wayfarers, had not a great deal to tell. It was twenty years or more since old Squire Bowes died, and no one had lived in the hall ever since except the gardener and his wife. Tom Windsor will be as old a man as myself, but he's a bit taller, and not so much in flesh quite, said the fat innkeeper. But there were stories about the house, I repeated, that they said prevented tenants from coming into it. Old wives' tales, many years ago, that'll be, sir. I forget em. I forget em all. Oh, yes, there'll always be, when a house is left so, foolish folk will always be talking. But I hadn't heard a word about it this twenty years. It was vain trying to pump him. The old landlord of the three nuns, for some reason, did not choose to tell tales of Barwick Hall, if he really did, as I suspected, remember them. I paid my reckoning and resumed my journey, well pleased with the good cheer of that old world inn, but a little disappointed. We had been driving for more than an hour when we began to cross a wild common, and I knew that, this past, a quarter of an hour would bring me to the door of Barwick Hall. The peat and firs were pretty soon left behind. We were again in the wooded scenery that I enjoyed so much, so entirely natural and pretty, and so little disturbed by traffic of any kind. I was looking from the chase window, and soon detected the object of which, for some time, my eye had been in search. Barwick Hall was a large, quaint house of that cage-work fashion known as black and white, in which the bars and angles of an oak framework contrast black as ebony, with the white plaster that overspreads the masonry built into its interstices. This steep-roofed Elizabethan house stood in the midst of park-like grounds of no great extent, but rendered imposing by the noble stature of the old trees that now cast their lengthening shadows eastward over the sward from the declining sun. The park wall was grey with age, and in many places laden with ivy. In deep, grey shadow that contrasted with the dim fires of evening reflected on the foliage above it, in a gentle hollow, stretched a lake that looked cold and black, and seemed, as it were, to skulk from observation with a guilty knowledge. I'd forgot that there was a lake at Barwick, but the moment this caught my eye, like the cold polish of a snake in the shadow, my instinct seems to recognise something dangerous, and I knew the lake was connected I could not remember how, with the story I had heard of this place in my boyhood. I drove up a grass-grown avenue, under the boughs of these noble trees, whose foliage, dyed in autumnal red and yellow, returned the beams of the western sun gorgeously. We drew up at the door. I got out and had a good look at the front of the house. It was a large and melancholy mansion, with signs of long neglect upon it, great wooden shutters in the old fashion, were barred outside across the windows. Grass and even nettles were growing thick on the courtyard, and a thin moss streaked the timber beams. The plaster was discoloured by time and weather, and bore great russet and yellow stains. The gloom was increased by several grand old trees that crowded close about the house. 
I mounted the steps and looked around. The dark lake lay near me now, a little to the left. It was not large, it may have covered some ten or twelve acres, but it added to the melancholy of the scene. Near the centre of it was a small island, with two old ash trees leaning toward each other, their pensive images reflected in the stirless water. The only cheery influence in this scene of antiquity, solitude and neglect was that the house and landscape were warmed by the ruddy western beams. I knocked, and my summons resounded hollow and ungenial in my ear, and the bell from far away returned a deep-mouthed and surly ring, as if it resented being roused from a score years' slumber. A light-limbed, jolly-looking old fellow, in a barracan jacket and gaiters, with a smile of welcome, and a very sharp red nose that seemed to promise good cheer, opened the door with a promptitude that indicated a hospitable expectation of my arrival. There was but little light in the hall, and that little lost itself in darkness in the background. It was very spacious and lofty, with a gallery running round it, which, when the door was open, was visible at two or three points. Almost in the dark, my new acquaintance led me across this wide hall into the room destined for my reception. It was spacious and wainscoted up to the ceiling. The furniture of this capacious chamber was old-fashioned and clumsy. There were curtains still to the windows, and a piece of turkey carpet lay upon the floor. Those windows were two in number, looking out, through the trunks of the trees close to the house, upon the lake. It needed all the fire, and all the pleasant associations of my entertainer's red nose, to light up this melancholy chamber. A door at its farther end admitted to the room that was prepared for my sleeping apartment. It was wainscoted like the other. It had a four-post bed with heavy tapestry curtains, and in other respects was furnished in the same old-world and ponderous style as the other room. Its windows, like those of that apartment, looked out upon the lake. Sombre and sad as these rooms were, they were yet scrupulously clean. I had nothing to complain of, but the effect was rather dispiriting. Having given some directions about supper, a pleasant incident to look forward to, and made a rapid toilet, I called on my friend with the gaiters and the red nose, Tom Windsor, whose occupation was that of a bailiff, or under-steward of the property, to accompany me, as we still had an hour or so of sun and twilight, in a walk over the grounds. It was a sweet autumn evening, and my guide, a hardy old fellow, strode at a pace that tasked me to keep up with. Among clumps of trees at the northern boundary of the Demesne, we lighted upon the little antique parish church. I was looking down upon it from an eminence, and the park wall interposed, but a little way down was a stile offering access to the road, and by this we approached the iron gate of the churchyard. I saw the church door. I saw the church door open. The sexton was replacing his pick, shovel, and spade, with which he'd just been digging a grave in the churchyard in their little repository under the stone stair of the tower. He was a polite, shrewd little hunchback who was very happy to show me over the church. Among the monuments was one that interested me. It was erected to commemorate the very squire Bowes from whom my two old maids had inherited the house and estate of Barwick. It spoke of him in terms of grandiloquent eulogy, and informed the Christian reader that he had died in the bosom of the Church of England at the age of seventy-one. I read this inscription by the parting beams of the setting sun, which disappeared behind the horizon just as we passed out from under the porch. Twenty years since the squire died,' said I, reflecting as I loitered still in the churchyard. "'Aye, sir, it will be twenty years in the ninth the last month.' And a very good old gentleman? Good-natured enough, and an easy gentleman he was, sir. I don't think while he lived he ever hurt a fly, acquiesced Tom Windsor. Ain't always easy saying what's in them, though, and what they may take or turn to afterwards, and some of them sort, I think, goes mad. You don't think he was out of his mind, I asked. He? La, no, not he, sir. A bit lazy, perhaps, like other old fellows. But I knew devilish well what he was about. Tom Windsor's account was a little enigmatical, but like old Squire Bowes, I was a bit lazy that evening, and asked no more questions about him. We got over the stile upon the narrow road that skirts the churchyard. It's overhung by elms more than a hundred years old, and in the twilight, which now prevailed, was growing very dark. As, side by side, we walked along the road, 
hemmed in by two loose stone-like walls, something running towards us in a zigzag line passed us at a wild pace with a sound like a frightened laugh or a shudder, and I saw as it passed that it was a human figure. I may confess now that I was a little startled. The dress of this figure was in part white. I know I mistook it for a white horse coming down the road at a gallop. Tom Windsor turned about and looked after the retreating figure. He'll be on his travels tonight, he said in a low tone. Easy served with a bed, that lad be. Six foot of dry peat or heath or a nook in a dry ditch. That lad hasn't slept once in a house this twenty year, and never will while grass grows. Is he mad? I asked. Something that way, sir. He's an idiot, an orpy. We call him Dick and the Devil, because the devil's almost the only word that's ever in his mouth. It struck me that this idiot was in some way connected with the story of old Squire Bowes. Queer things are told of him, I dare say, I suggested. More or less, sir, more or less. Queer stories, some. Twenty years since he slept in a house? That's about the time the Squire died, I continued. So it will be, sir, and not very long after. You must tell me all about that, Tom, tonight, when I can hear it comfortably, after supper. Tom did not seem to like my invitation, and looked straight before him as we trudged on. He said, You see, sir, the house has been quiet, and now it's been troubling folk inside the walls or out, all round the woods of Barwick this ten years or more, and my old woman down there is clear against talking about such matters, and thinks it best, and so do I, to let sleeping dogs be. He dropped his voice towards the close of the sentence, and nodded significantly. We soon reached a point where he unlocked a wicket in the park wall by which we entered the grounds of Barwick once more. The twilight deepening over the landscape, the huge and solemn trees, and the distant outline of the haunted house exercised a sombre influence on me, which together with the fatigue of a day of travel and the brisk walk we had had, disinclined me to interrupt the silence in which my companion now indulged. A certain air of comparative comfort on our arrival in great measure dissipated the gloom that was stealing over me. Although it was by no means a cold night, I was very glad to see some wood blazing in the grate, and a pair of candles aiding the light of the fire made the room look cheerful. A small table, with a very white cloth and preparations for supper, was also a very agreeable object. I should have liked very well, under these influences, to have listened to Tom Windsor's story but after supper I grew too sleepy to attempt to lead him on the subject, and after yawning for a time I found there was no use in contending against my drowsiness, so I betook myself to my bedroom, and by ten o'clock was fast asleep. What interruption I experienced that night I shall tell you presently. It was not much, but it was very odd. By next night I had completed my work at Barwick. From early morning until then I was so incessantly occupied and hard-worked that I had no time to think over the singular occurrence to which I have just referred. Behold me, however, at length once more seated at my little supper-table, having ended a comfortable meal. It had been a sultry day, and I had thrown one of the large windows up as high as it would go. I was sitting near it, with my brandy and water at my elbow, looking out into the dark. There was no moon and the trees that are grouped about the house make the darkness round it supernaturally profound on such nights. Tom, said I, so soon as the jug of hot punch I'd supplied him with began to exercise its genial and communicative influence, you must tell me who beside your wife and you and myself slept in the house last night. Tom, sitting near the door, set down his tumbler and looked at me askance while you might count seven without speaking a word. "'Who slept in the house?' he repeated very deliberately. "'Not a living soul, sir,' and he looked hard at me, still evidently expecting something more. "'That is very odd,' I said, returning his stare, and feeling really a little odd. "'You're sure you weren't in my room last night?' "'Not till I came to call you, sir, this morning. I can make oath of that.' "'Well,' said I, "'there was someone there. I can make oath of that.' I was so tired I couldn't make up my mind to get up, but I was waked by a sound that I thought was someone flinging down the two tin boxes in which my papers were locked up, violently on the floor. 
I heard a slow step on the ground, and there was light in the room, though I remembered having put out my candle. I thought it must have been you who'd come in for my clothes and upset the boxes by accident. Whoever he was, he went out, and the light with him. I was about to settle again when, the curtain being a little open at the foot of the bed, I saw a light on the wall opposite, such as a candle from outside would cast if the door were very cautiously opening. I started up in the bed, drew the curtain aside, and saw that the door was opening, and admitting light from outside. It is close, you know, to the head of the bed. A hand was holding on the edge of the door and pushing it open. Not a bit like yours, a very singular hand. Let me look at yours. He extended it for my inspection. Oh, no, there's nothing wrong with your hand. This was differently shaped, fatter, and the middle finger was stunted and shorter than the rest, looking as if it had once been broken, and the nail was crooked like a claw. I called out, Who's there? And the light and the hand were withdrawn, and I saw and heard no more of my visitor. So sure as you're a living man, that was him, exclaimed Tom Windsor, his nose growing pale and his eyes almost starting out of his head. Who? I asked. Old Squire Bowles. "'Twas his hand you saw. "'The Lord of mercy on us,' answered Tom. "'The broken finger and the nail bent like a hoop. "'Well, for you, sir, he didn't come back when you called that time. "'You came here about them Miss Dimmock's business, "'and he never meant they should have a foot of ground in Barwick, "'and he was making a will to give it away quite different "'when death took him short. "'He never was uncivil to no one, but he couldn't abide them ladies.' My mind misgave me when I heard twas about their business you were coming. And now you see how it is he'll be at his old tricks again. With some pressure and a little more punch, I induced Tom Windsor to explain his mysterious allusions by recounting the occurrences which followed the old squire's death. Squire Bowes of Barwick died without making a will, as you know, said Tom, and all the folk round were sorry, that is to say, sir, as sorry as folk will be for an old man that's seen a long tale of years and has no right to grumble that death's knocked an hour too soon at his door, the squire was well liked. He was never in a passion or said a hard word, and he would not hurt a fly. And that made what happened after his decease the more surprising. The first thing these ladies did when they got the property was to buy stock for the park. It was not wise, in any case, to graze the land on their own account, but they little knew all they had to contend with. Before long something went wrong with the cattle. First one and then another took sick and died, and so on, till the loss began to grow heavy. Then queer stories, little by little, began to be told. It was said, first by one, then by another, that Squire Bowes was seen, about evening time, walking just as he used to do when he was alive, among the old trees, leaning on his stick, and sometimes, when he came up with the cattle, he'd stop and lay his hand kindly on the back of one of them, and that one was sure to fall sick next day, and die soon after. No one ever met him in the park, or in the woods, or ever saw him except a good distance off, but they knew his gait and his figure well, and the clothes he used to wear, and they could tell the beast he laid his hands on by its colour, white, dun, or black, and that beast was sure to sicken and die. The neighbours grew shy of taking the path over the park, and no one liked to walk in the woods or come inside the bounds of Barwick, and the cattle went on sickening and dying as before. At that time there was one Thomas Pike. He'd been a groom to the old squire, and he was in care of the place, and was the only one that used to sleep in the house. Tom was vexed hearing these stories, which he didn't believe the half on them, and more especial as he couldn't get man or boy to herd the cattle, all being afeard. So he wrote to Matlock in Derbyshire for his brother Richard Pike, clever lad, and one that knew nought of the story of old Squire Walken. Dick came, and the cattle were better. Folk said they could still see the old choir sometimes, walking as before, in openings of the wood, with his stick in his hand, but he was shy of coming nigh the cattle, whatever his reason might be, since Dick and Pike came. And he used to stand a long way off, looking at them, with no more stir in him, than a trunk of one of the old trees, for an hour at a time, till the shape melted away, little by little, like the smoke of a fire that burns out. Tom Pike and his brother Dickon, being the only living souls in the house, lay in the big bed in the servants' room, the house being fast barred and locked, one night in November. Tom was lying near the wall, and he told me as wide awake as ever he was by noonday. 
his brother Dickon lay outside and was sound asleep. Well, as Tom lay thinking, with his eyes turned towards the door, it opened slowly, and who should come in but old Squire Bowes, his face looking as dead as he was in the coffin. Tom's very breath left his body. He couldn't take his eyes off him, and he felt his hair rising up on his head. The squire came to the side of the bed and put his arms under Dickon and lifted the boy in a dead sleep all the time and carried him out at the door. Such was the appearance to Tom Pike's eyes, and he was ready to swear to it anywhere. When this happened, the light, wherever it came from, all on a sudden went out, and Tom couldn't see his own hand before him. More dead than alive, he lay till daylight. Sure enough, his brother Dickon was gone. No sign of him could be discovered about the house, and with some trouble he got a couple of the neighbours to help him search the woods and grounds. Not a sign of him anywhere. At last, one of them thought of the island in the lake. The little boat was moored to the old post at the water's edge. In they got, though with small hope of finding him there. Find him, nevertheless, they did, sitting under a big ash tree, quite out of his wits, and to all their questions he answered nothing but one cry. Bores the devil! See him! See him! Bores the devil! An idiot they found him, and so he will be till God sets all things right. No one could ever get him to sleep under roof tree more. He wanders from house to house while daylight lasts, and no one cares to lock the harmless creature in the workhouse. And folk would rather not meet him after nightfall, for they think where he is, there may be worse things near. A silence followed Tom's story. He and I were alone in that large room. I was sitting near the open window, looking into the dark night air. I fancied I saw something white move across it, and I heard a sound like low talking that swelled into a discordant shriek. Oh, oh Bo's the, the devil. devil! Over, Over your, your shoulder! shoulder. <laughs> I started up and saw by the light of the candle with which Tom strode to the window the wild eyes and blighted face of the idiot as, with a sudden change of mood, he drew off, whispering and tittering to himself and holding up his long fingers and looking at the tips like a hand of glory. Tom pulled down the window. The story and its epilogue were over. I confess I was rather glad when I heard the sound of the horse's hoofs on the courtyard a few minutes later, and still gladder when, having bidden Tom a kind farewell, I had left the neglected house of Barwick a mile behind me.